This morning, what I'd like to do is introduce to you Steve Dace. Uh, Steve is on Blaze TV radio and podcast for two hours each weekday, right after Glenn Beck. He is the author of several books, including the book, The Nefarious Plot, which was made into the movie. And almost 300 of you came last Sunday night to actually watch the movie. National media coast to coast recognizes Steve as an influential voice in his home state of Iowa's First and Nation caucuses. He's frequently been quoted in national media on political issues, especially presidential politics. Steve has also appeared on three major cable news networks. But more importantly, Steve is a husband, a father, and a child of God. So let this Ohio State Buckeye please welcome a Michigan Wolverine. Let's give him a warm welcome. Um, I got to tell you guys, I have had the honor of terrorizing multiple churches and pulpits over the years who really made a mistake in judgment by letting me speak at them. And I have to tell you, I've, I've heard a lot of great music teams. This is one of the best I've ever heard. Okay? I mean, it is. They're really good. And it's the first time I've ever seen a fiddle and a banjo in a pulpit north of Tennessee. So <laughs> props to that. All right? little redneck in the room. That's good. Okay? Um, before I get to the main message, we're going to preach out of Romans 13 this morning. There's, a, there's another matter of great importance culturally uh, that needs addressed. And unfortunately, we live in an era when the church has largely, maybe not this ministry, which is why they're dumb enough to invite me to come, uh, but the church corporately and manifestly has gone silent in the face of many great evils happening in the culture uh, and has decided that's not our fight, now's not the time, we're not involved in that, and, and we have seen the sorts of moral outrages and scourges that if you are, you know, I'm Gen X, if you're a boomer, you would have thought, no way I'll ever see that in my lifetime, right? You're probably saying that to yourself right now a lot. There's no way I'd ever see this in my lifetime, and yet you're seeing this right now. And one that, has, that just hasn't gotten the attention that I think it merits, and we need to address it, I think, more frequently from the pulpits of America, and I think you probably know what I'm talking about. No matter where you go in this country, and trust me, I've seen it with my own eyes, the shower pressure of America's hotels is absolutely dreadful, <laughs> all right? It is dreadful. My wife and I, and this is a complete first world problem, we have gotten to the point of judging hotels now by the shower pressure and nothing else, all right? No matter where you go, apparently they, you know, sp we're all sprinkled baptism now. That's how we bathe. Turn the water on Let's go, Brandon, turn the water on, please, okay? In all seriousness, let's pray. Blessed are you, our Lord, our God, King of the universe. Father, these are difficult times, as you know better than us, and you know that more difficult times lie ahead. So prepare our hearts to hear your word, prepare my heart to preach your word, and then after this is over, prepare all of our hearts to go and do your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This will be at times a challenging message. I don't know how to do any other kind, so forgive me. I'm kind of a one-trick pony. Um, but I, I want to say from the outset, though, it is because you are capable for such a time as this. You are capable. God is a God of order. He does not make mistakes. It wasn't like, ah, oh, snap. The Western church has fallen apart, and just by happenstance, happenstance, all we have are these guys. What are we going to do? Okay? No. You're here for this moment. I had a doctor from Ohio come up to me at an event I spoke at last night, and you know, he, he dared to actually follow science and treat people with a respiratory illness the last few years, and for that, he's facing all kinds of forms of licensure, threat, persecution. I have lots of friends or people I know that are doctors around the country, people who are uh, renowned scientists, started multiple medical journals, Mayo educated, and 
they're facing the exact same thing. And they never saw it coming because there was no way to see it coming. They just figured that you could always rely on science, that, you know, we'd always be a country and a culture that on some level valued truth. And there have been periods of time based on the color of your skin or your socio-political status where we've not always lived up to that as a nation, but eventually we course correct because of the foundations that we were founded on, eventually. It takes longer than it should in different eras. It's taken multiple generations at times, but eventually we course correct. But now we're seeing things that it, it, you fear there's no course correction coming. And that's because there's not. This is revival or bust territory now. We are not going to vote our way out of this. Not that voting is not important. I work full time in politics. It's my vocation. It is not my calling. This is. But it's my vocation. It's, you know, Paul made tents. I work full time in politics. I know many of the names that you see on TV. Trust me. Even if some, most of those names were to win election, we're not voting our way out of this. We're, the hole is too deep. I did a political event last night. Number one applause line at the event is when a speaker said there are only two genders. And I thought to myself, we are reduced to that being our applause line now. What's next? Air is good to breathe. That's our new applause line. <laughs> Food is tasty. That's the new applause line. Water for thirst. I mean, if we're at the point that there's only two genders are the applause lines. We're at that point, if you know what I'm saying. There's no more lines to cross. The next line, it says, ash heap to history. Mouth of madness, enter here. Belly flop into the pit of Abaddon here. That's what's next. We are in revival or bust territory. And the fight now is not in the election sphere or the political sphere, it's in your sphere. Like the doctor in Ohio who thought he was just gonna practice medicine and save lives and now they're trying to take his livelihood from him. I had a, a person come up to me before, after the last service and they know someone who's a nurse. And she has been saying, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I, I, I assist in surgeries. What's gonna happen when the next surgery they want me to assist in is, you know, genital mutilation of a child and I'm not gonna to wanna to participate in that. These are questions that unless you were a certain socioeconomic status or ethnicity or a certain skin color in past eras of this country, as Christians, we never had to wrestle with except for those regretful exceptions in our nation's history. And the reason why is because this was a country originally, at least on some level, inspired by Christian thought. If you, you know, soon we're going to be celebrating Thanksgiving. Who were the pilgrims? They were Puritans. Now, this just goes to show you how much we've lost appreciation for our heritage as a people. Even Christians now call themselves puritanical like it's a put down. Oh, that's puritanical. Well, there wouldn't be a country here. We wouldn't be doing a service here today if it weren't for the Puritans. By the way, who are the Puritans fleeing? They weren't fleeing the Moors, which is the old historical term for Islamists. They weren't fleeing the pagans. They were fleeing the Church of England. They were fleeing other Christians. They, were, they, had to, they had to risk their lives. And in the next couple of years, over 100, over 50% over of the people who originally got in that boat would be dead. They had to risk everything to come here to a savage land to escape other Christians. And in the first governing document in the history of our country, the Mayflower Compact, they made it very clear that the intent was to advance the kingdom of God. And so from that very moment albeit imperfectly, many of the institutions and creeds and ideals that framed and founded the country were at least imbued with some modicum of Christianity, even if the people doing so, it was just a slogan to them and they didn't mean it. And so this is a unique challenge for the people in this room and for people like this in rooms across America. You're going to live through something that's never existed now. Never. 
regardless of your socioeconomic economic status, the color of your skin, never has there been a moment in America where collectively Christians were not given the benefit of the doubt in the culture. Where collectively Christianity was not the default ethic in the culture. Even the horror movies we make now, we make demonic possession horror movies. They don't even bring the priest in anymore. The new Exorcist movie, I've not seen it. I've read about it. I'm told they brought a witch doctor in. They brought Beelzebub in to cast out Beelzebub. Literally. I remember the first time I, I recognized this trend. I went and saw many years ago a movie called Paranormal Activity. I am fascinated when the culture makes films about the spiritual realm and what it will see and what it will say. It was the first time ever this couple is haunted by a demonic entity, and they end up Googling it. They call a demonologist from the university. They even ask her dad, you know, like the sign on the wall, and it's a wonderful life. Ask dad, he knows, right? Okay. They ask every possible institution of wisdom in the culture what to do with this evil that is bedeviling them, except one. Can you guess which one it is? The church. Years ago, when, we used to, when our kids were little and, we, and, and Amy's parents still lived in Grand Rapids, we used to make the trek back and forth during holiday season so they could have them with our kids. And I remember being at our, my in-law's house one year, and it was when the PlayStation 3 came out. And there were massive tramplings at Targets and malls in Grand Rapids, and it was the lead story on the nightly news. And people, are, people died. And, and, and the news is asking, how could this have happened? And they're asking psychiatrists, they're asking grief counselors, academics. Do you know who was never on the screen, who was never asked? The church. No one asked the pastor. No one asked the priest. This is now fully, despite the relics of our history you see around you, this is now a fully post-Christian culture. <laughs> Lying to ourselves, drowning in nostalgia, won't change that fact. And all of you in this room is just one human resources meeting away from, well, it's called DEI or it's called ESG. Really, it's called D-E-M-O-N-I-C, okay? That's really what it's called. And we're going to kind of, if you don't mind, we're going to kind of have you set aside that whole biblical worldview thing and bow to our idol instead. I'm sure you're okay with it. You need this check, right? All of you in this room are one HR meeting away from being in that battle. Some of you have already been in that battle. The chickens have come home to roost here. This is now systemic, and it is right down at the molecular level in our own homes now. If you have your child in a government school, you are one school day away from your child coming home and saying, you know, I spoke to my guidance counselor, and, and she told me I'm not really a he, but a she. That could happen to any of you in this room, any school day. That's where we are. The war is here. Now, we're not ready for this war. For every church like this that would dare let somebody like me come up and give you this message, there are hundreds more that would not have anything close to the spine to do it. So we're not ready. We've spent a generation being purpose-driven and seeker-friendly. And thus... We're not seeking after him, and we've lost our purpose. But he's not surprised, and there's always, as he said to Elijah at his weakest moment, there's always a remnant. There's always 7,000 men in Israel who have not taken the need to bail yet. There's always a remnant. Our Lord does his best with remnants. 110 people were all that was left of the ministry of Jesus after three and a half years in an upper room. They received the Holy Spirit, and in the span of two centuries did something that the Visigoths couldn't do, the Moors couldn't do. They conquered Rome. This country was founded by 56 signers of a Declaration of Independence, and they ended up defeating the empire upon whom it said, the sun never sets. Our Lord does his best work with remnants. One 29-year-old Baptist seamstress got on a bus one day in Alabama, and she didn't have a large following. She didn't have a mass of money. She didn't have legal representation. She got on a bus one day, and they told her, go sit in the back, and she uttered just one word. That's all she said was one word. Didn't give him a dissertation. She said no. And Martin Luther King Jr. said that was the spark that ignited the civil rights movement. Our Lord does his best work with remnants. 
That's the good news. The bad news is you're going to be that remnant. That's you. Now, you're not ready, but you are capable. And so I'm going to do what I can do here for the next 20 minutes to get you as ready as I can, or at least tee it up and make enough of you enemies of mine so that weeks from now, when your pastor has to, has to do the cleanup work, he's going to seem a lot nicer and friendlier to you, and you'll take it from him, okay? So let's go to Romans 13. I, I love preaching out of Romans. People ask me all the time, what should I look for in a church? I, one of my pat answers is always, like, if you go, it's very seldom someone's like, hi, we're the Wiccan church of the three lesbians who love our cats, and, and we deny every doctrine, come here. Very seldom do they do that, right? All right? Everybody's statement online looks like the Nicene Creed, okay? So you gotta, you know, you gotta be discerning. I always like to tell people, find out what that church is done or is willing to do with Romans. Because Romans, you can't fake your way out of Romans. Romans is the greatest, in my opinion, the greatest theological treatise ever written in human history. It is the apex of Paul's ministry with divine inspiration. It will destroy arguments against the gospel that have not even been presented yet. You could literally write every apologetic work against every form of philosophical, theological argument against the scriptures just straight out of what Paul writes in Romans. It's devastating. And so posers get exposed because it doesn't just expose arguments against the faith. It exposes those within the faith too, lest we become self-righteous. So I love preaching out of Romans. I love finding out what churches are willing to do with Romans. It is a litmus test. You can't hide Romans. You can't. Not even Jim Harbaugh is going to steal your signals, okay? <laughs> or your signs, all right? Because apparently that worked so well for you guys last year when you changed your signals up. But that's another message, okay? So now that you hate me, let's get right into it, all right? I want to start with this preface from maybe the greatest English-speaking preacher who ever lived, Charles Spurgeon. This is what he wrote as the preface to his commentary on Romans 13. What is a believer's relationship to government? How should a believer relate to the laws of the land? At the beginning of chapter 12, now let's pause there. This is very important. He is adding context. First Bible conference I ever went to after I was newly converted, the pastor or the preacher said something that has stuck with me for 20 years now that I've, as a Christian. Text without context is just pretext. Now, if I thought tradition belonged up here, at the same line of authority with the scriptures, I'd be at a place holding mass this morning and not with you. I don't believe that. I'm sola scriptura. The word of God sits at the head of the table. Okay? But I do believe tradition deserves a seat at that table. And I think that we have made a grave error in modern evangelicalism by essentially ejecting tradition altogether. So we lack a lot of context. I'll give you one example, very practical, and it's in the news right now. You're probably following what's going on with Israel and Hamas since a few weeks ago. And it kind of feels like a little post 9-11 all over again where we're acting like Islam's like this new thing. We didn't know what it was. The church, well, you know, do we all worship the same God? I mean, how many of you know that Jesus is in, that Jesus is in the Quran? He is. He's, he's, he's references the son of Mary. The Quran actually teaches that Jesus wasn't crucified, but that Allah tricked the Jews into not killing Jesus. And so therefore, if Jesus wasn't crucified, then he also wasn't what? Resurrected. Now, our entire faith is not predicated on a creed or a doctrine or even the scriptures, Paul says. It is predicated on a fact. Did this occur? He says, if Christ be not raised, your preaching is in vain. You're all dead in your sins. That's what makes this thing unique. We are basing everything we do on a, whether this is a fact or not. Not whether our belief is better or not, but whether this is a fact. Did Jesus, was there a, was there a carpenter from Nazareth who was physically dead and on the third day walked out of there like a boss? Did that happen or not? Did he walk out of that tomb or not? If he did, listen to everything him and his followers have to say. If he didn't, don't. It's that simple. Well, we can't possibly worship the same God when one religion says he wasn't crucified and the other religion says God was crucified and resurrected. So we're acting like these, this stuff is all brand new. Did you know in the 7th century, a guy named John from Damascus actually traveled throughout the Middle East, the Fertile Crescent, having debates at the dawn of Islam with sheiks and caliphs 
about their beliefs versus Christianity. Nothing new under the sun, just new people under the sun who haven't heard it yet. But we don't teach that tradition anymore. We don't know that history of our faith anymore. And so we've kind of turned the Bible in like this theoretical exercise that's not really actually applicable. Tradition is good. It is good to learn from the mistakes of previous generations and from their successes. For example, boomers make much better music and much better movies than my generation has made so far. Should have learned from that, okay? It is good. I mean, you probably taught your kid how to ride a bike or catch a baseball like you were taught. You probably have grandma or nana's best banana bread or chocolate chip cookie recipe. That's tradition. And so that's context. So Paul is saying we cannot look at Romans 13 isolated. We have to look at the previous chapter. Remember, chapters did not come into the Bible to like the 12th century, guys. And so when Paul's letters were read, they were not read. No one stood up and said, Lydia didn't stand up and read, the, and Tabitha didn't stand up and say, this is chapter four. No, they just read it as a letter. Read the whole thing as a letter. And so in chapter 12, Paul talks about the renewing of your mind. And that when you now have a biblical worldview, there will be conflicts with the world. That's unavoidable. And that you are to actually represent that conflict. And that that conflict will come to you even if you try to avoid it just by living out what you believe. Even if you don't directly confront people. Even if, you're not, as, even if you don't enjoy being confrontational as much as I do, the confrontation will come to you just because of the testimony of what you represent and whom. So it's with that context Spurgeon goes on. Paul called upon believers to not be conformed to the world, but transformed by the renewing of their minds. In the remainder of the chapter, Paul provided several important examples of what a renewed mind would look and act like. As believers, we are not to be conformed to the mindset of this world, yet there remains in this world vestiges of God's rule through the institutions he has ordained. Lewis once observed the fact that almost every major religion has a lot of similar moral codes is emblematic of the fact that we all come from one singular creator. Spurgeon is touching on that here. Even pagan institutions, if they have any morality, are acknowledging God. This is what Paul would say when he said, a law unto ourselves, we know. We know what is right and wrong. We know. Raise your hand if you've ever had to teach your kid how to use the word no. No? Never to teach your kid how to be selfish. Ever just, the mom's gotten together here at the mom's croup. Oh, my kid's just not selfish enough. Walk through an airport or a mall and you see someone bowed down with their little baby or their little toddler. All right, Timmy, say it with me now. No, you can do it. No. They just know. No. Because we're sinners. Even though they're adorable, they're still sinners. We don't have to be taught to be selfish. We have to be taught not to be. Spurgeon says two very important institutions that have been ordained by God and look at the two that he mentioned. Man, this is the 19th century he's writing this. He says, two that, have been, that are very important that are ordained by God are marriage and civil government. Marriage and civil government. Huh. Do we have any conflicts between marriage and civil government in our day and age? No. Hmm. Now, why are those two important? Because marriage would populate the earth, but also that's the first form of government. The first understanding of heritage and legacy that any human has or is neglected to get access to, as someone like me, who's biological, didn't bother, is family. And then ultimately, on a corporate level, government is to punish human sinfulness. Think I'm wrong. Okay. Some of you, how many of you believe you can't legislate morality? Well, I'm here to tell you, that's the only thing you can legislate. Every piece of legislation is someone's morality. Paul writes in Romans 13, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resist what God has appointed and those who resist will incur judgment. If you've been in an evangelical church that actually is still preaching Romans in the last 50 years in America and when they came upon Romans 13, they probably just did their entire message on that part and didn't teach you the rest. That's out of context. One of the great Bible teachers of this era is John MacArthur. His church is featured in a film that's out right now, The Essential Church. 
And it talks about his church and others in California doing battle with Governor Newsom during COVID about whether they can be open or not. Well, the problem is, instinctively, John and his elders know that what the governor is doing is wrong. But here's the problem. John taught for decades that the American Revolution was a violation of Romans 13. By the way, the colonists, our founders, they actually debated Romans 13 amongst themselves. Remember, Christianity was heavily influential in American culture. And there were great debates. They had people that were called Anabaptists, who were basically pacifists, Mennonites or Quakers in places like Pennsylvania, who didn't believe you could take up arms against the state no matter what. They actually did debate this amongst themselves. And you see allusions to this in the Declaration. For example, when Thomas Jefferson writes, Lord, he asked God to judge the rectitude of our actions, meaning motivations. Meaning if we have wrongly divided your word, if we are in violation of your laws of nature, and what we're doing, if this revolt is wrong, do not let it succeed. Do not let us set a terrible example for, the, for posterity. That's the language of the Declaration. They debated this themselves. Well, MacArthur taught for decades that the American Revolution was a violation of it. And now suddenly, his church is square in the crosshairs. And so you see in this film that him and his elders, they go back. They re-examine Romans 13. They look at commentaries on Romans 13. And here's the thing you find about Romans 13. It was written by Who? Paul, which means who knows what it meant? Paul, because he's the author. I know we live in this era of deconstructionism or even reconstructionism, that you can deconstruct someone's original words or reconstruct them to your truth and what you want them to be. But someone's words, the words mean what the author meant them to mean. And we know what Paul meant by these words by his life, and I'll get to this in a moment. And so in this film, The Essential Church, they go back and they look and they, re they realize we've got it wrong. And we had taught this scripture wrong for decades. And now rightly dividing the word, they end up defeating Gavin Newsom in court, setting a very important precedent for future attempts to close the church, which I promise you will come, I promise. Because what happened during COVID was a test, and collectively, we failed. And so they're going to come back. To quote the great prophet Stephen King, they always come back. Let's continue. Would you have no fear over who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. Who determines what is good, by the way? God. So therefore, the only thing we can legislate is morality. But if you do wrong, who determines what is wrong? God. Therefore, the only thing we can legislate is morality. An avenger, for if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God. This is why government has power. To be an avenger, to carry out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Not to pay the debt to society, but the wrath of God. That's why government gives them this power. This is the principle of headship. Something men have gotten wrong in the last generation or two of America. And because of that, we gave rise to a destructive philosophy known as third wave feminism. Headship does not mean power or authority. It means in the kingdom of God, in God's economy, it means responsibility. If you have headship over the home like I do over mine, it means I'm responsible for what goes on there. Things go wrong, God's coming to me first. But the authority is who? God. Is the authority the person who is the giver of the headship or the receiver of it? The giver. Because he has the power to give it. So God is the authority, not government. It even says here in the beginning, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God. God is the authority. I am the head of my home, not the authority God is. If I decide after watching Breaking Bad that drug dealing is a booming business, should my wife submit to me now and become my accomplice? Is that what she should do? No, because I'm no longer in submission to whom? God, am I the authority in the home? No. Who is? God. I am the head of the home, but that means I'm responsible. If I violate that responsibility, should my, should my wife follow me or God? God, and Paul displays this in one of his other epistles, by the way, when he says, follow me as I what? Follow Christ. That's apostolic headship, but he's not the authority, is he? God is. Same relationship here with government. Government is the head, but it is not the authority God is. So what happens when there's a conflict between them? 
Paul answers this question later in Romans 13 in a portion of the chapter you've probably never heard a sermon from. And the reason why, here's why. You want to know what the number one problem in the American church is today? The pastors have become too soft. Nobody wants to kill them anymore. That's the number one problem. Paul writes at the end, for because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God. They, I, wait, I, I thought they, uh, uh, that's where they're accountable to God? Yeah, that's kind of why we do this oath of office thing. Oh, maybe you guys have seen that. How's it end, by the way? So help me, God. Yeah. Paul concludes it with this. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. Now, this is a fleshing out of what Jesus says about render under Caesar that which is Caesar's, and render under God that which is God's. So Paul is a very unique person, very unique. He's a Jew who's a Roman citizen. Before he even becomes the apostle Paul, he is still a handful of people that were both fully Jewish and able to access Roman citizenship. He wasn't just randomly picked by God, but specifically because he had the ability to both go to the synagogues and reason through the prophecies that Yeshua is Messiah, but also now has civil liberties and freedoms to go throughout the Roman Empire and take that message to the Gentiles as well. He might have been the only one for all we know. The Romans did not cavalierly at this period of time hand out citizenship and certainly never to Jews. So he is rare. That's why he was chosen. He even uses his civil liberties when he's falsely accused. He invokes his civil liberties to get a trial and to have a chance to face his accusers. Very few Jews. Most Jews, if you were accused of anything, Rome could just grab you that day and put you on a tree by the end of the evening to asphyxiate to death like they did Christ. Not a Roman citizen. Pay taxes to whom taxes are owed. So Paul is thankful. The Romans have created proto-versions of pavement. It's safer to travel than it ever was before. They police the shipping lanes. It's safer by relative standards to the first century to travel mass transit via the seas than it ever was before. He is thankful to Caesar for those things. By the way, Caesar at this time is Nero. Yeah, that Nero. The one who married his homosexual slave in the Senate. The one who started Rome on fire and claimed that the Christians did it. The one who lit the Christians on fires. He would stake, put them on stakes and light them on fire to light his orgies at night. That Nero. Paul is thankful to that Nero for the public services that he has taken taxes and performed because via God's sovereignty, Nero is able to be used to get God's message out despite his wickedness. But here's the thing. There comes a moment when Nero asks for something that doesn't belong to him. In honor, he is not owed. Bow down and worship me as God. Kaiser Curious, Latin for Caesar is Lord. And Paul said, no. Christos curious. Christ is Lord. And Nero said, you know, because you were such a good citizen all those other times and preached submission to the authority, we'll let this one go have a nice life. No. He removed his head from his shoulders. He cut his head off. So again, words are what the author meant them to be, not what we want them to be. If Paul meant that we were to submit to government no matter how evil it is, how wicked it is, then why was his head removed? Peter will actually echo this language later in one of his epistles. How did he die? He was hung upside down for the same thing. Refusing to give honor to people who asked for an honor they were not owed. In this era, you as a Christian are going to face pressure that no American Christians have ever collectively faced before. The system is no longer here to defend your belief system. It is no longer here to defend your God-given rights, but to take them away and get you to declare that the government is God. You are going to have to learn to say no. You're going to have to learn to count it all joy, to suffer for the name like the apostles. Now, I know this is counter to a lot of the messages we're getting in our suburban, exurban churches of evangelicalism today. But the reality is there has been no greater testimony to our faithfulness and our Lord than our willingness to suffer for him. He gave everything for us. Surely we can give up something for him, a job, a relationship, something. 
Now, some of you may be thinking, I don't know that I'm ready for this. I have good news. We're going to find out because the enemy wants to find out. You won't run to the battle. He'll come to you, and he already is. Now, here's the, here's the thing. This has all happened before. Maybe you're not ready, but you are capable. Because all it takes to get ready is to actually listen to the lyrics of the songs you sung here this morning and be willing to live those out. Be willing to say, no, I will not comply. I will not do this. I will not betray my Lord. There once was a monk named Telemachus. And he was assigned to visit Rome on a mission for the church. And he had never been there before. And as he enters into the, the city, uh, he, here, he goes by this massive structure known as the Colosseum. And he, he sees this in, uh, incredible throng of people. And he hears all this raucous cheer. And he's like, wow. None of that. They don't have anything like that back at uh, the monastery. I'm going to go check this out. And he walks into the Colosseum. And he is appalled at what he sees. Appalled. It's the gladiator games. He's watching people be murdered, dismembered, and he's watching crowds cheer, children as young as those sitting in the front, sitting in the, in the stands, cheering it on. And he stands up in the stands and he screams out in Latin, in the name of Christ, no, or stop, or forbear. No one can hear him. Does it again, no one can hear him. Waddles his way down to the floor of the Colosseum. And he's out there now on the dirt. And he looks up at the stands and he screams out, in the name of Christ, stop, no, forbear, in Latin. Now the crowd is at attention. Now, they, now they're hearing him. And they think, well, maybe this is the intermission entertainment. Maybe this is a joke. You know, the gladiators got to get a water break before they go back to slaughtering each other. And he's meant to keep us occupied. But then he continues more adamantly, in the name of Christ, stop. And now they can tell he means it. He's serious. And the crowd begins to boo and hiss loudly. Turn on him. One of the gladiators takes his spear and shish kebabs Telemachus right there on the floor of the Colosseum. He kills him right there. Now that is the end of the life of Telemachus, but the story does not end there. The rest of Rome was so appalled. This is at a time where Christianity is finally on the ascendancy in Rome. The rest of Rome is so appalled at the, the savagery displayed toward Telemachus that did you know that is the last day that the gladiator games ever happened in Rome? He ended them. They never happened after that. We don't remember the names of the gladiators. We don't remember the names of those in the crowd who booed we remember the name of Telemachus and great is his reward in heaven. So will be yours. Some of you will be asked to give what Telemachus gave. Some of you won't be asked to give that much, but you'll be asked to give up something that means, something mu that means much to you. I promise you, you have not lived a fulfilled Christian life until you have been willing to give up something for your Lord and to stand for him. You can do it. You must do it. This is your race. This is why you were saved. For this, for such a time as this. You are the people God meant to be here at this point in time. Get in the race. Run your race. Finish your race. Thank you.